beyond your aging generations. Tony DeVale, Life Masters, is a man of many talents. He is not a one-trick pony. Uh, he has helped radio stations get off the ground. He has helped many businesses get off the ground. He speaks with a passion. When I was tasked with finding someone to talk on team building, Tony's name came out top for me because he has such a passion. Yes, Tony, it's a compliment to you. <laughs> I'll do his PR for him. Uh, he speaks with such a passion, he thinks at such a deep level, and he operates with great courage, which is something that I, I think that um, uh, we, we need to see more of. So Tony, you can, you're of age, you can tell them anything more that you want to of yourself. Um, please do come and take the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony DeVale. Good morning. That's about a level one. Good morning. 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 Okay, we got a few live people here. Oh, well damn. Jeez, I thought I was at the wrong party. Oh, no, thank you. Jeez. I'll get you to write that down so I can I'll check it every time. So my goal in the next 45 minutes is to rattle your cage, press your button, and share some interesting stuff that I've discovered in my journey over the last 15 years or so doing team transformation, personal transformation, and being an alchemist in, in working with people. And so, for me, the world is moving away from the industrial era towards this, the whole mental service, emotional experience time. And I've just recently become accredited for the science of happiness at work through the Eye Opening Institute. And it's, as much as I spend a lot of time reading and researching, it's brought a lot more information which I'd love to share with you. So, we all, we all know this hooligan that jumps off buildings and other planes and balloons. But they, they make a lot of money, they make a lot of difference. But his, the essence of their business, if you think about their brand, is that fun. He's just re retired, I believe, from Apple. But they have a cult like Holly Davidson. They have a cult that follows their, I'm a PC man, as you can see. But what is it that they, their people do that, that brings their customers, that they love the products? Do your staff love your products? Do your customers love your products? So think about this. How happy are you at work on a scale between 0 and 10? How happy are you at work today? Think about it. 0 is no happiness. 10 is happy. What's your general level of happiness? Research shows that your range somewhere in those three. In my team building research, we normally get people to fill in profiles before the workshops. The graphs are very similar. I'll show you some information. And why is this important? Because we're out of the slave era where you can force people, you could whip them and force them to carry more bricks or more loads or, or build more pyramids. We're into the era where when they walk out of the door, they take their asset with them. They take their relationships with them, their knowledge, their skill, their intellectual property with them. Can I just see by a show of hands, who sent your staff on some kind of thinking training workshop? How to think? Check. This is the machine that we're meant to be using, and no one's had any real training on it. So, you're here today, I don't know what you're really aiming to get, but I'm going to give you a reframe. So think about, it's a cold winter's morning, and this tourist happens upon a construction site. It's a little windy and a little cold. And there's this man hammering away at this piece of rock. And the tourist inquisitively says to this man, Sir, what are you doing? He says, Can't you bloody see I'm cutting a stone? Sorry, sorry. He goes off a little further and he sees another man hammering in, the, in the, the drizzle. And he says, Sir, what are you doing? He says, Can't you see? I'm building this thing. Sorry. And he comes across another guy who's whistling away in the drizzle and the rain. And he's chipping away. And he's whistling. He says, Sir, what are you doing? He says, Can't you see? I'm building this beautiful cathedral for my people. Who do you think has a better day of those three? Who wakes up in the morning and says, Good morning, God, versus, Good God, it's morning. <laughs> <laughs> and so we now know that there is a hard science behind the science of happiness at work. It is validated, it is predictable, it is measurable. 
And I've put together with the science of happiness, I've added my own model, which is around happiness, appreciative inquiry, changing the way we address problems, resilience. You can have a great IQ, you might have a wonderful EQ. If you have no AQ and you fall down and stay down, who cares? What value are you? And the D is about decision, devolving decision making, control and power down to the lowest level. The reality is, in today's world, your competitive advantage is through psychological capital. What is the person's level of self-efficacy? How much hope do they have in the dream and the vision and the possibility of your organization delivering? How optimistic or resilient are they around the quality of leadership and integrity? How strong are they? How quickly can they bounce back? I'll show you some research on, on stress levels. And how much energy do they have? Are they sleeping well enough? Are they eating well enough? Are they exercising well enough? Are they managing this biological system? Because we, we lose most of our energy through them. And so if you think around the happy, it's the same with resilience. About 5 to 15% of your people are climbers. They, they are bounce backers. Automatically they will bounce back. They, they're hardy. They are the deliverers. The rest, well, either they're a cancer, same as engagement, they the they the disengagers, or they're doing just enough, just enough to get their salary. So why is this science of happiness important? Why do we want to find better ways to engage and empower our people? Well, imagine if your staff were more energized, happier, more engaged, loved the work, they woke up and they loved what they did. They were motivated, they were confident, and look at the, lot, the, bars, the bottom line, they contributed 25% more. Because where are you going to squeeze more productivity out of your team? And that's the push today, do more with less. Longer hours? Can I see who, who's working longer hours now than they used to five years ago? Uh, my dad used to do like an 8.30 to 4. Friday is earlier than I was at home by 4. I know people in my computer days, I was doing 6 in the morning till 11 at night. Because there is no work-life balance, because the blur, you know, we have our phones with us and our notebooks and our PDAs, the, the balance between life and business has kind of got blurred. But what we do know, before any success, you need to have happiness. It is the fundamental driving force that keeps you going. Some research was done, and think about your own workplace, is on the left-hand column, what do people want from a workplace? This is not managers, this is the staff. They want friendly people, they want connection, they want enjoyable work, good bosses, some balance, varied work, and they want to do something worthwhile. That's the left side. The right hand side, we know from our work and our research, are, are human needs. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, where you've been, there are six fundamental core human needs. How does your work contract address those needs? How does your work environment and your culture address those needs? Because we all have a need for love, to love and be loved. And some people get shocked. I was doing work with an accounting company. And when I went in for the pre-event interview, the lady said, um, please don't use that four-letter word. I said, sorry? She says, there's a, a four-letter word that you, that you use that I'm scared of because you'll lose all credibility. So I said, and that is? She said, love. She said, please do not use the word L-O-V-E when you're in front of our directors. So I did the whole of the senior management team. And I thought, what kind of workplace do you have where you can't use four little words like love? And so the other needs that people have are some kind of certainty and comfort. We want connection. We want some uncertainty as well. But we also want significance and we want meaning and we want growth. We want to add some value to the world. The older people, um, I can see you. You kind of fit up and see the blessed parts here. The older people were the loyal workers, you know, eight to four. The younger generation don't want to work their life away. They want balance, they want meaning, they want value. You can't hold them with the old style contract. And so think of what is your biggest problem at work? What is your biggest HR issue that you have? As we go forward, as we move away from what I call the old industrial era of the king having everything and the Learjet and the ivory tower and the staff at the bottom having nothing. We're moving away to a very different model. This is research 
of happiness around the world. South Africa, you will see there in the little zero, is just next to Russia in level of happiness. We're a five out of ten. We're an ongelukkig klomp mensen. In my research with team building, I asked the question, so on a scale between have got everything and have got nothing, where do you think you are on food, clothing, shelter, possibility and opportunity? And without fail, the majority of the people in the group say below 50% of quality of life on the planet. And then I show them a little video that shows that if you've got a roof over your head and hot and cold water and a cupboard and a bed, you're in the top 25%. And then if you have a phone and if you have internet access, you're in the top 12%. The truth is we live in heaven. Wherever we are, typically in our quality of life, but our mindset, our, what we focus on, seems to say we're living in hell. So how are you going to get more productivity out of your team? What are you going to do? You can hit them more, you can offer bigger carrots, you can use bigger sticks, but the stick doesn't work when you're not there. And I've seen some really hectic workplaces, we did some work with one of the mines, and in going through the research data, it was very clear that this one manager had a problem with trust. And so I asked one or two of the people, and they said, no, he walks around with a stick. Uh, you know, a dowel stick, he physically walks around flashing a stick around. And I said, well, does he ever hit you? No, but you never know when he's going to. And so I, uh, the guy that arranged the, the team building, I asked him, do we fix the problem or do you have holy cows? He said, no, fix everything. So I arranged the meeting with the guy, and he arrived with his stick, and I kind of flinched away and said, please don't hit me, please don't hit me, I, I promise I won't do anything wrong, and he laughed. And I said to him, well, either you're asleep or you're evil. Just tell me now so I understand how to handle you. you know, either way, it's okay. And it worked out that he was completely asleep and unconscious as to the impact that his little stock he was having on his team and the performance and the trust. And so you can't use the stick really to get sustainable change anymore. We have to find another way. And it has to be an intrinsic part of the process. And so why is the science of happiness important? Well, sick leave. I know in the government, in some of the areas we work, sick leave is up to 30 days a year. 30 days, the one guy, <laughs> he stays away from work. And it's not necessarily because he's sick. He just doesn't feel like it. And so the research shows that happy people take less sick leave. And this is in a, in a normal business environment, in the public environment, it's worse. You obviously want to keep your talent and be able to have predictable staff and HR, all your HR issues. Staying in your job, unhappy people say, I might stay for nine months before I move on. I read some interesting research that said at least 60% of people are looking for a new job. Imagine if you woke up and 30% of your staff moved on. Would that have an effect? Would it cause a, cause a problem for you? And the happiest people are going to stay in their jobs. They say, I'm going to stay for this long. People typically join an organization because they love the meaning and the value and the vision that it brings to society, but they leave their immediate superior. Number one reason, 64% of Americans said they left because they felt unappreciated. In all of my research, and I'll show you a graph now, that is probably the number one thing in all of the teams is through lack of appreciation. And so what does that do? Well, unhappy people spend about half their time on the task. Happy people spend 78% of their time on tasks. That's 25% improvement. Can you imagine if you had 25% more productivity or 25% more staff? 60 days a year, more productivity in your organization. Would that have an impact for you? And so this is what happens in companies where people are happy. Productivity, customer service, customer satisfaction, customer engagement all go up. And the number one thing that the greeters look for, profit, all goes up. There's benefit for the individual and for the organization. Happiness helps people be, do and have more. More sex, more drugs, more rock and roll, more money, more life. They researched nuns, you know, nun in the morning, nun at night, and they found that the happy nuns lived a full ten years longer. Now, that may not be important for you when you're down at my apprentice's age of 19 or 20, but when you're at my age of like 50 and 60, 
in 10 years is a lot of mileage to have extra on your tires. <laughs> they also show that marriage helps you be happier, but I found this research. As you see the graph, the top one there is the before marriage. As you go up to the marriage, the happiness builds, and then once you get married, oh, hot. It goes down. <laughs> Research also shows that children re reduce happiness. <laughs> and then you can see the divorce. Life goes down in the, the, the days before divorce, and then there's this glint of hope as you talk to the divorce attorney, and your happiness recovers again. <laughs> So, in the research that I was doing before and from the work that we got from the team building, we discovered that when people are asleep, unconscious, which most people are, 50% of productivity comes from the environment, the culture, the management style, the leadership style, that right off, the 10 and the 40. When people are asleep, they are reactive to the situation. And so at least half of results come from management style. And the other half on the left is your, what they call your set point. Uh, Dr. Leibomirsky Leib on the bottom left there, she's the lady who's done all this research. But when you've had training and coaching and woken people up that you have choice, that you are the master of your state, let's play again. Can I play with you quickly? Who's been angry in the last 90 days? Wow. <laughs> Holy God. Okay. Just all together on the count of three, call out who made you angry. One, two, three. Who made you angry? The boss. The husband, the children, the taxis. Please, please forgive my honesty, but it's only way I can help you wake up. You're all liars. They are absolute, vi vicious, vindictive, manipulating liars, and you're asleep. Because if your husband makes you angry, who's in charge of you? Sorry? If you're angry, if your husband makes you angry, who's in charge of you? But then why do we say, but you made me so angry, the boss made me so angry, the taxi made me so angry. The truth is, I'm the master of my state. Yes, I have a set point of my disposition, of my happiness, of my attitude. But at least 40% of you could be happier today when you walk out of here. Because if you make yourself unhappy, who makes you happy? Yourself. Wake up, people. Make a decision to be happy. So, quickly, look to the left, look to the right, give them a really big smile. Look to your left, give them a big smile. Look to the right, give them a big smile. And you see, you can write your first check of happiness. Because happiness is contagious. Happiness has value. Happiness is like a virus. The dark spots are happy people. You've heard of the six degrees of separation? You know the six degrees? Happiness goes to three degrees. Happiness goes down two or three levels. What kind, what kind of energy do you have in your workplace? What's happened to myself here? What kind of happiness do you have in your workplace? Do you bring that? I always say everybody brings happiness. Some by coming into the room, and some by leaving the room. <laughs> Which are you? <laughs> you see, when you're awake and aware and conscious, you can make new choices. You can make intelligent choices. But the line that scares me the most is the bottom line, because so many people, when I do their pre-team building interviews, they say, I hate my job. I just, I'm trapped here, I can't get out, I've got to find something else. Think about your staff, how many love the work that they do where you are? The reality is, if you want to motivate your people, you have to give them some kind of autonomy, some kind of decision making. You have to give them some real meaning and purpose and value for what they are doing, giving their life away. And then you've got to give them, with the edge you you've got to give them the chance to build mastery. That's skill mastery and personal mastery, because I know many people who have got the skills. I was in the Navy, down in the Bluff, and I had a friend there that was, he was a killing machine. We had taught that, trained him to be a killing machine. He was a recce. But we went into a situation where one of his phobias jumped up. And this killing machine became a, a blob of gibbering fear. And what I came to understand is, yes, you can know how to do it. 
People know what to do, but they don't do what they know because they don't feel like it. Feelings create moods. Moods predispose you to behavior. If you want more performance, you cannot force people on a sustained basis. Do you like what you do? Do your staff like what they do? Or are you making them clean toilets? I fly to Cape Town quite regularly or around the country for team building, and I love to go to Oatabo. Because when I go to the loo next to the Wimpy, anybody know the loo next to the Wimpy upstairs there? <laughs> the ladies don't know the James loo, I hope. Well, not right now. But when you go in there, there's a young man. And the first time I went, I, I was astounded because as I walked in, he said, Good morning, sir. Welcome to my office. I'm like, what? <laughs> now, I've never had this before. You know, he really took me by surprise. And uh, um, I kind of, uh, uh, he says, yeah, can I show you to an officer? I said, well, I need one of these. He said, hold on, hold on. He went in, he wiped the seat, and he got the papers on that, and he jumped back, and he says, please enjoy yourself, sir. <laughs> and I, I then came out. I was completely flabbergasted at the attitude. If you know what men are like, men, toilets can be bad places. <laughs> it's just that's, you know, if you need to sit and oaks, decide not to lift the seat, that's normal. It's just the way pigs live sometimes. <laughs> this man enjoyed what he did. He made, I gave him a 10 minute tip, I don't normally tip easily, but I gave him a 10 minute tip just because he gave me the story that I can share with you. And I've been there another three times and he's the exact same every day I meet him. And he's made me think about how I show up in the world. Because if he can be grateful and excited and happy, cleaning this guy's thing lose, hell, we live in heaven. And so how do we let our stuff shine? How do you get yourself to shine? How do we get into that flow? You know, who's that guy, Chick, Chick sent me Ilyikovsky with a coffee and a two brown sugars. He talks about flow. Getting into that zone where you, you lose track of time, of lines get blurred, you, you love what you do. I, I do a variety of different things, and there are times when I'm working, which for me isn't work, I love what I do. And you look up the next thing, it's five o'clock, and the day's gone. You know, where's the day gone? And what you've come to discover, number one, is that if you're not using your strength, if you're not playing to your strengths, if you've got a square pig in a round hole, it's a problem. You need to like what you're doing. If, if you like and, and love what you're doing, that flow feeling comes a whole lot easier. And it needs to be a challenge. It needs to be requisite for your skill and your ability, and I'll show you a little graph how it fits in. But the challenge now is, how do you make that valuable enough for the business? How do you take a person's passion and talent and energy, and how do you mold that and guide that so that it becomes an asset in your organization? So here's the, where the flow is. You, people are, I know people that have got great skills, but they're doing low, low, low jobs. They are bored to death. You know, they bring their body to work and their head somewhere else. They're on Facebook for three hours. Or I heard some scary numbers, 190 minutes a day that some people spend on Facebook. It's because there's nothing else that's, to, that's there to grab them. And so at the end of the day, the, the leadership or the C-suite and the shareholders are looking for profit and growth of some kind. And you need customers today. But we have this zero moment of truth. I don't know if you know about this new ZMOP, the zero moment of truth, how people are using the web to, to decide, make the decisions in buying. And so loyalty is a problem. But I do have places where I go to because of the relationship I have with those people. What kind of relationships do your staff have with your customers? I was doing some training for a restaurateur and his restaurant, and he wanted his staff to, to perform and provide perfect service service, an excellent service. And I said, well, do they know what it looks like? Have you showed them what it looks like? No, that they should know. And I made him sit down and put the staff at the table and the management served them. And just from that experience, they got to truly understand what was required. But if, you're, if you don't look after your staff, how do you expect them to look after your customers? You know, it's, they are customers internally for you. Because you want happy customers. Happy customers spend more. They're more loyal. They come back more frequently. They buy deeper into your products or service. But you need great service, and I'm sure you've been in the same place where you go and you stand in the queue, and the, peop the people at the tools don't even look at you, they don't even look you in the eye, they don't even greet you and say, hi, how are you? They are just so numbed out. And so the foundation of success is happiness. You need happy employees that are going to bring you more money. This is a, the question was, I work primarily for the money. 
A lot of people don't. That's the zero part. But the others, the, to the right hand side, they're working just for the money. Think about you. Would you work for half of what you earn? Would you work for nothing? Do you love your, do you love your work enough? Is it a cause? Are you doing something powerful and making a difference in the world? Or do you wake up and say, good God, it's morning, let me go and my salary again. <laughs> Once again, this is, I do not get enough recognition. I feel unappreciated. The zero on the left hand side is a majority. But there's a large portion of people that feel unappreciated. And if you don't feel that workplace is fair, that there's no integrity, and you feel unappreciated, how much of your happiness, how much of your power, how much of your energy, how much of your love do you bring to the workplace? I don't know why you come to work. Maybe you get paid a lot of money and you've got nothing else to do. And you don't want to stay home. But think about this when you are dealing with your staff, when you are dealing with your, your high level guys and doing your strategy. By the age of 65, this is your destiny. This is your staff's destiny. 3% will be wealthy. They'll be very wealthy. Won't have to worry about money at all. 7% will do okay. 12% will have to continue working. About a third will be dead. And at least 50% are going to eat dog food. Yeah. My, my folks both did. My, both both my, my parents ate dog food. They ran out of money. Your challenge that you have is we aren't living a whole lot longer. 65 in the old days, in my dad's day, 65 was the life. My dad died at 64. But you used to retire and die within five to seven years. But think of what's the oldest person you know right now? The oldest living person, what do you know? Call out a number. 93? 103. How the hell are you and your staff going to fund from 65 to 103? Now you can't say you don't know that this is your destiny or their destiny. So hopefully you'll do something a little different in how you handle your staff. Because if you're looking for peak performance, you can't pay the persons. And for me, there's no integrity in that. We will get past this line of slavery of pay the least amount that, that staff are a cost. Because if you're going to get proficiency and passion and, and heart and buy-in and, and energy and, and emotional engagement and create a workplace where there's this positive appreciation, this appreciative inquiry process where people are what I call keepers and I go fishing. And you get a keeper, which is a lack of fish, and you get a putbacker, which is a little fishy. How many of your staff are keepers that have got the knowledge, skill, ability, wisdom, talent, that you want them on your team? How many of them are, are staff that you want to keep? And so, what is the larger vision for you, for your life, for your team, for your organization? Are you just here for the bottom line, money, 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 greed, what I call greedership? I did work, uh, I was doing videoing for a, a suite company, and it was at their December session, they were putting in a new SAP system. I'm sure, you, I'm sure many of you know about SAP and implementation. And the European director stood up and he lashed them. He screamed at them about how they'd lost 30 million here and done this there. And he, I promise you for 45 minutes he called them every name other than the four letter words. In fact, he used it once or twice. And I, outside there, there was food and sweets enough for a thousand people. And I went home and I wrote an article that said, slavery is alive and well. Because the only thing that mattered to this man was the number. Tough tacky that you had a heart attack. Tough tacky that you died. Tough tacky that you had a divorce or whatever. Tough. You're in the matrix. Bring me the money. And I think we part, we passed that line. We were moving towards a bit more heart than just a plain head. Anybody heard of a little company, a little internet company called Zeppos? The little online company that used to sell ladies shoes and now they sell clothing and bits and pieces. That was just recently bought by Google. They kind of doubled their turnover every year for 10 or 12 years. They did 1.2 billion dollars last year. This is their company mandate. This is their company rules. Do you see anywhere there it says make more money for me? If that's your drive, if that's how you want the people to, to do more, you're going to lose their heart. You might have the body there, but you're not going to, to get the full person. You're not going to get the teamwork, the connection, the love and the care there. And so if you're going to have this team, if you're going to have an organization that has value and meaning and brings something worthwhile to the planet, we need a team. We all, we all want to belong. It's one of Maslow's needs is, is belonging. 
but we need a team of skills. This is South African research, 150 companies responded, it's not my research, it's from a professor at UNISA. Think about your organization, how good is trust? And you know what I'm shocked at? I go into companies right across the country, weekly, and when we do the research, I'm expecting that the manager knows more than me. And when he sees the results, he says, wow, I didn't know it was so bad. These are the issues that you have in, in your teams normally. They're not impossible to address, but I think people just, they don't want to see them. We delete and distort it. If you're an NLP, we delete and distort and We paint this, we have these rose-colored glasses. No, it's kind of okay, we'll, we'll ignore it. Jack Welsh knows it, but if you don't have the trust, if you don't have the glue that holds your team together, you're paying a huge tax. How good is your trust? In most, of the, in most, 90% of all organizations that I deal, trust is actually smashed. It's down between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, some up at 6 and 7 and 8. We do workshops that we were able to accelerate that over time. I don't know where your organization is, but this is out of 150 people that volunteered. Do you have trust? Do you have credibility? Do you have buy-in from all of your people? Because the real challenge we have is, we are so diverse in our cultures, in our beliefs, in our values, in our expectations, no one's actually got us together to align them. Think about when you bring a new person onto the team, huh? what kind of induction process do they have? <coughs> At Zappos, they actually offer you $2,000 to not join the company. Yep. The staff have the choice of, do you join my team or not? One person, 10% of an organization, your, your company, like your body, is a biological system. 10% of an organization can destroy a system. 10% of a team, 10, negative 10% of a team can take your team down. Do you give your people any kind of connection? This was a graph that I put together. Um, the higher the graph is more people, that's the score from more people. Um, the orange is women, the dark blue is men. But you can see very few people on the right yet, on your right, are at the 96% the, the of trust. Very few. A lot more people down the other side of the lack of trust. And what does that do? Well, this is the one for me that is the worst. Uh, Bruce Lipton got a book called Biology of Belief. Scientifically validates now that most illness, if not all, is initiated, accelerated, and exacerbated by stress. The little gray up red part on the left there is kind of the maximum level of stress between, five, between zero and about 35. This is 100%. All the way to the right here is, is high stress, damaging. Anything over 35 is physically damaging to the organism. In most of my, in most, I'm saying probably, if, if not all of the organizations, stress is at a damaging level on average for more than 70% of the staff. And a large part of that is, is through lack of awareness, lack of a culture that is supportive, lack of connection, lack of communication, lack of trust, lack of the psychological assets. Because remember, perception creates reality. And the perception of people has been allowed to be created without thinking, without constructing. And many managers have just inherited an environment and not actually constructed anything intelligently. And so there's very little leadership. I use the word from a professor at Jesus, and he talks about a team overseas, if you're from the East, fingers together and someone's face is a blessing, and fingers apart and their face is a curse. And so he says, well, what's the difference between a blessing and a curse? Well, it's about an inch and a half, you know, two inches. You know, so are we, are we different, but together, as a team, as an organization, as a blessing? Or are we different and separate, which is a curse? Because the reality is we've grown just so disconnected from everything. We, and the problem is email is controlled by how you think and feel up here. You can write a positive message, but if a person's got a negative mindset, they're going to interpret that email negatively. And so email is probably one of the most destructive communication platforms we have. These are the two things that business is looking for. Typically they want results. But it's also about relationships. How good are your relationships? How good are your relationships? How good are your staff with those relationships? Can your staff shine? Have you chosen the right person for the right job? Are you giving them responsibility rather than saying, you just do the job? What kind of connection do you have? I, I find we have such a political environment between teams. Even in teams, people don't talk to each other, they don't connect. It's a, this connect, they're working in silos. 
Do you play? Do you laugh? Do you have fun? I've been to places that are they're so dreary. Yes, there might have been an IT shop. No, I had an IT background. But I kind of put a heart back into me. But do you have any fun? How often do you laugh? How often do you have positivity? Are your people robust enough to have what I call radically honest conversations? In my experience, people are fragile. You can't go to them and say, I think we could improve here. We're just so shell-shocked from focusing on the negative without using a positive approach. How many of your staff are shining? Are you shining? Think about it. If you died today, done, dead. Think about it. Are you living your dream? Are you doing the best that you can? Are you sharing what you came to this planet to share? Or are you like those people of financial slut that sold your soul for the money? Well, you can start to take action and do something and do more than just generate value for your organization. So what I'd like you to do is decide what is one big thing that you can do today? When you walk away today, what is one thing that you could do? that would add meaning and value and contribution and significance in your life and your, your staff's life. So how do we go forward? How do we incorporate this into our team? It starts with me. If it is to be, it's up to me. Choose. Make a decision. Back to the 40%. Make a choice. We are blessed. We live in happiness. Make the choice. Get to know yourself. Get to understand how you think. Often when I talk to people, I say, well, just, you know, just turn on that little voice inside your head and let it say something. The guy says, I don't have a little voice. I said, well, it's the voice that said, I don't have a little voice. That's the one. <laughs> we all talk to each other, but what kind of voice do you have? There was an Indian warrior, and he went to the, the, the uh, medicine man, and he said, so you need to help me. I have a, a black wolf on this shoulder, and a white wolf on this shoulder, and they're fighting constantly. They keep on fighting. What am I going to do? Who's going to win? And he said, the one that you feed the most will be the winner. Which one do you feed? Do you step up, show up, and speak up, and make a difference as a leader in your organization, or do you just keep yourself under the radar because it's not safe? Well, today you can make a decision. Do something. Do something that, that, that takes courage, that, that takes you to another level of yourself and your life. And do something for beyond yourself. So if you're going to die, has your life had meaning? Have you brought love and happiness and light to the world? For yourself and for others? You know, on that scale of 3% and 7%, where do you think your staff are going to be because they impacted, were impacted by you? Will you have some impact or no impact? Do you matter at all in what you do or in what you bring? We know from... I, when I was younger, I used to write my goals on my shower wall and I wanted a, a converted on the CDs. And the day I bought it, I was so excited, I had arrived. And I drove it down the highway, I was juiced. Yeah. Do you know how long it took for it to become another stock star? Just a piece of metal with four wheels? Within probably a month it was a wheel, it was a car. And so, money buys happiness or pleasure to a point, it's like sex, it's, you get a peak and then it drops off. <laughs> That's why you've got to keep coming back. It's like drugs. You, know, you have a peak and drops off. You've got to keep coming back. It's, you get kind of have to keep on building it. But if you love what you do and you're passionate about what you do and it supports your talents and it aligns with your vision and your values, then you have a chance to get into those flow moments where, where time disappears, where it, you are just part of something bigger. But the real thing is when you're doing something, when you're doing something that makes a difference in the world, that that brings the, the love, that brings us closer together, that creates a brighter future, that creates something now that people love to come to. Where people won't remember what you do, but they will remember how you make them feel. How do you make the people feel? Are you asleep like that guy with a stick? Do the people leave you because of the relationship or lack thereof? In most companies, in most, the pressure from the top is make more money. Who gives a damn about meaning? But if you're going to retain your talent, and you're going to keep growing, you're going to have to find a different bait to keep the people coming into the system. Because people will work for a living, but they'll die for a, a cause. What is your cause? And so, 
if you look at this whole story of, of happiness and psychological uh, capital, we have three things around the outside that are vital. The trust. How much pride do your staff have in your organization? How much trust are you building? Are you the one that's building it? And how much recognition are you getting for them? So, these are the steps you can take to start being happy. So, number one is a level five good morning. The good morning I got from you was a level one. So, can I have a level five? Good morning. Good morning. There we go. It's about a four and a bit, eh? <laughs> praise, praise three people at least each morning. Find, catch them doing things right. Greet everybody. I'm astounded in our team stuff. How many people say my boss doesn't even greet me in the morning? Where do you live? Do some kind of random act of kindness. When I, had, I started Candy Community Radio Station in 1994, and we, we started this whole concept of do a random act of kindness just because you can. It, it makes you feel better. It doesn't last a hell of a long time. It's that peak of feeling, but it, it gets you going. Celebrate the victories. Don't focus on the negatives. Use appreciative inquiry. That dream, discover, design, destiny. Use a positive approach. Here's the thing that does the best. If you want to be happier, and it lasts, the, the consequences of this last up to six months at a time, is write about three good things that have happened each day and why they happened. Make a note, jot it down, get a little diary. We know, we can predict happiness and divorce to an accuracy level of 90%. Think of your conversations. This is the power of negativity, the power of positivity. It takes three positives to neutralize one negative. What are your conversations like at home? What are your conversations like in your head? What are your conversations like in your team? Because just for a neutral balance, you need three positives to neutralize one negative. In fact, if you want a thriving team, you need six to one. Six positive comments to one negative comment will keep you happy, healthy, married, good team, flowing team, growing team. There's our pride. Are your people proud to work? What do they say when they talk to their staff, when they talk to their friends, when they talk to their family? Have you built trust? Have you built credibility? Are you credible? And do you give enough recognition? I'm, I know from my research, people feel unappreciated and lack of recognition is the number one issue while they go away. And it, it takes nothing. Just look to each side of you, give a person a compliment. Either side of you, give the person some kind of positive compliment. Give a positive compliment to your left, please. One, two, three, go. Give a positive compliment. Give a positive compliment to your right, please. Now, how easy was that? Just look at the room, how easy was that? And so, as you go forward today, with your laughter and your recognition, remember this proverb. I love fishing. I'm not going to get married. I'm never going to inherit a fortune. But I can tell you that I wake up every day with such a passion and an energy and enthusiasm because I love what I do. Because I'm making a positive difference and every single day I get to help, support, assist and grow somebody. If I died today, hallelujah, I've made a positive impact in someone's life. Have you? Thank you. If you're interested in doing a happiness profile, please take a card and email me. I uh, will arrange for you through our iHope Institute that you can do a, we've got a special kind of try before you buy happiness profile. But I'm happy to talk to you about anything about making the world a better place. Management theories and all those kinds of things. 
I loved your uh, phrase of readership. Is that yours? Did you come up with that? Thank you. Um, I'm going to use it and I'll give you credit for that. That was really a lovely one. Yeah.